The first two days of Watch Dogs were like living in a nightmare. Let me give you a bit of important advice here. Never, ever, ever buy a AAA PC game on launch. And I mean never. It is always a nightmare. You see this happening on this very channel every time. Horrible launch day issues are business as usual for PC ports. It has been for years. You can't reliably wait out for a solid PC version until months after release. For high-tech, expensive, hardware-demanding games, you should always wait a while for patches and for price drops. After about two days of patching, troubleshooting, and reinstalling, I finally got the performance and stability of Watch Dogs to be playable, and I was finally able to enjoy the game, but god, the first two days were a never-ending torrent of pain, misery, and self-doubt. The hatred was boiling to a point where I couldn't take it anymore. I wanted to end it all. I had to cut my... Watch Dogs is a game about hacking, I think. It's also about shooting people in the face and crashing fast cars into stuff and knocking people out with silent takedowns. It's about the evils of high-tech government surveillance and how ethical vigilantism is a morally contradictory concept that is impractical as a substitute for law enforcement, also necessary for people's ethical self-fulfillment or something. It's, um, there's, there's a lot going on here. What Watch Dogs actually is, is a visual metaphor for Ubisoft kicking and screaming about how it doesn't want to be creative even when its own game designers start wanting the company to be creative. It's a bold premise because it's working in a very limiting setting. It's working within normalcy. Take a look at the city, for example. It doesn't look like a vulgar, hyper-violent satire video game city. It looks like Chicago. Our hero is a slightly chubby white guy who looks like he could be someone's dad. His name, Aiden Pierce, carries some implications, but it doesn't sound unrealistic. And check out his design. How many video game heroes wear a baseball cap? That's not normal. The signature melee weapon here is a foldable police baton, which isn't exactly iconic as far as video game weapons go. The other standout in the arsenal is a cell phone. When you're not using it to steal cars, steal bank accounts, buy on people's weird hobbies, or live out your horrible prejudices, you're using it to fight crime. Aiden Pierce is a slightly chubby white guy who runs around a normal looking city fighting crime using his cell phone and a police baton. That's not video gamey. But his pockets can carry up to 30 high-powered military-grade weapons and explosives that actually do the job a hell of a lot faster and easier, and that is video gamey as hell. Contradiction is the whole theme of this game, isn't it? It subverts a whole lot of cliches, but it relies on a whole lot of other cliches. Aiden Pierce is hardly a bald space marine, but he is a very familiar, non-superpowered, gadgety superhero, complete with a bat cave and a wacky comedy relief sidekick and even a mask. The game is a sandbox game that doesn't need to be a sandbox game. It works best when you're on foot in tight, claustrophobic areas that are dense with detail, rather than when you're driving around the wide open city. That's because the genre twist here is a, quote, hacking, unquote, mechanic that turns Aiden's cell phone into a remote control use button. You have one button for hacking that usually either blows stuff up or moves it out of the way. Hackable objects are activated by line of sight. All you need to do to hack something is look at it, even if it's through a fuzzy video feed. This allows for missions where you can infiltrate into a guarded area, grab the objective, and make your escape entirely remotely. The interplay between hackable cameras, environmental interactions, and traps is the game's primary strength. The best missions are the ones where you can use the hacking to creatively improvise a solution out of a tricky fight or to carve a stealth route through a heavily guarded interior. At its best moments, it almost feels like a Deus Ex game, where you're combining your character's own stealth abilities with his tech abilities to use a high-tech security system against itself. The stealth actually does remind me a whole lot of the stealth in Human Revolution. You have a speedy crouch walk that is completely silent and an overpowered non-lethal takedown move, and I bet you could actually do non-lethal runs because of that move. Stealth is usually the most encouraged and the most fun way to play these missions. Uh, but I say usually, because there are other moments where it seems to want you to do cover shooting instead. The problem with the hacking and the stealth being so simple is that it's contextual as hell. Your ability to exploit those tools isn't bound to your skill as a player, but rather by how dense the map designer decided to put hackable objects or stealth cover into a room. And the density of those tools is not consistent. Some of the levels are more than happy to lock you in a room with armor dudes and give you very few hackables to work around them with. In which case you can and should shoot back because there are actually no incentivized rewards for playing stealthy. 
That's a shame for a lot of reasons, and one is that the gunplay does not feel good. Weapons fire quietly, muzzle flash is muffled, your crosshair movement is slow thanks to negative mouse acceleration, and the recoil perfectly resets you back on target after every shot. This leads to shootouts that feel sticky, methodical, and underwhelming, which would be okay if Watch Dogs was a dedicated stealth game, but it's not. It's easier and faster to shoot bad guys than it is to sneak around bad guys, and you aren't well rewarded for sneaking around them either, so it isn't rational to. It's more fun to, but that fun is discouraged by the level design and the scoring system. Driving around is also a huge part of this game that does not feel good at all. Cars peel out super fast with a slight tap of the accelerator. They turn too slow to make for real nimble, fast maneuvering, so it's pretty hard to not drive like a jerk. Which actually is okay, since cops won't see you crashing into the city infrastructure anyway. For some reason, while I was playing, there were no police patrolling the streets of a police state version of Chicago. They had to be called in, they were never cruising the streets or even walking down the sidewalk. It was so weird and bizarre, I still can't decide if that was a deliberate choice or an oversight. For a game that costs this much time and money to make, Watch Dogs has an inexcusable lack of polish. How come no NPCs are ever riding in the passenger seat? Why can you shoot some streetlights but not others? Why are these train tracks placed here so that if a train actually used them, they would end up running off the bridge? Why is there only one save slot? Why did I never run out of ammo my whole time playing? Why isn't this texture attached to the sign it's supposed to be on? Why can't cops chase you across water? even though there are plenty of AI NPCs driving boats across water. Why are there no bullet impacts when you shoot water, or, or even dirt for that matter? I don't know what happened here. How could they forget to add a particle effect when you shoot at the dirt underneath your very feet? It doesn't even have to be a good looking particle effect, it just has to be there. If there was even the lamest little brown poof popping out of the ground, no one would notice this sort of thing. Is, is this the bad management inflating game budgets that you hear so many AAA devs complain about? It feels incredibly surreal to watch that happen in front of my face. So driving and shooting feel bad, the stealth feels pretty nice, and the hacking feels totally contingent on how the level designers felt. You also have the sandbox part of this game, and it's the same dispassionate Ubisoft sandbox game formula that you've played before. This company has managed to deconstruct the unpredictable and emergent systems of sandbox games into a space that allows for either scripted plots or optional chores. It's very methodical, you know the routine. You climb a tower, which pastes a whole bunch of icons onto your map. You walk up to those icons, you hit the use button, and that teleports you into an alternate world where little contextual mini-challenges are plastered into a little gated area of this big fancy map. These chores are fed into a really abstract RPG upgrade system that teleports arbitrary rewards onto your character with no explanation. Find 10 audio logs and a new shotgun will materialize inside your pockets from thin air. Invade people's privacy 10 times and you get a new car. You also get EXP and skill points for doing chores, which can be spent to upgrade things completely unrelated to your character's bodily abilities. Somehow, the battery life of Aiden's phone, or the quality of his car, or the damage of his shotgun shells improves by spending EXP points. That's a weird thing to complain about, but I think that's getting more relevant. This is yet another incredibly abstract and almost arbitrary upgrade system that sandbox games tend to rely on. They use these things as a crutch to encourage the player to complete these chores. And Watch Dogs does not need to be a sandbox game. It does not need to deal with all the compromises and the abstractions that sandbox games deal with. Its driving is bad, its shooting is bad, its RPG unlocking system feels really out of place in a twitchy stealth action game like this. When you're building an environment as big as a sandbox game, you kinda have to compromise the detail of the smaller interior areas, but those are the areas that Watch Dogs uses best. At its worst moments, it feels like a bad, weirdly low-budget GTA clone. But at its best moments, it feels like a pretty good Deus Ex game. Partly because, much like Deus Ex, the story is shamefully entertaining. I actually wanted to know what was going to happen next. That's another part of the game that is weirdly detached from its own self. The story is split into two wildly different personalities that are talking about the same central arc. 
They killed your niece, and she was a cute little girl. Now it's time to kill hundreds of them back. That's Aiden's backstory. That's the opening cutscene. What branches off from there is one half of a game that really wants to be The Wire. It wants to have morally gray characters and tell a story critical of Aiden's own vigilantism. And this story beats him relentlessly for thinking he's above the law. It wants to show crime as a result of poverty, inequality, and the resulting financial desperation while still managing to develop incredibly strong, despicable villains. It wants to make a point about how how these characters feel conflicted or guilty about the things they do, and weirdly sympathetic moments come from those complications. But the other half of the game really wants to be, like, Batman. It wants to have villains who laugh maniacally, and it wants to make the experience of being Aiden into this cool guy power fantasy about having gadgety superpowers, while also ham-fisting in a science fiction overtone on top of a world that is played fairly realistically. It wants to convey a message about how high-tech surveillance is creepy and evil, even though you end up using high-tech surveillance to fight crimes way better than the cops can fight crimes. This half of the game introduces some ridiculous villains, and this gothed up 90s hacker chick, and a legit goddamn bat cave, and also these horrible memes that Aiden supposedly types out onto billboards. It's like one half of the game was written by fairly smart game writers who knew what they were doing, and the other half was written by out of touch 40 year olds trying to appeal to the 19 year olds on 4chan. I really hate to have to spoil stuff to explain it, but. In order to illustrate my point, I want to take a look at the climax of this story. I think this is where that juxtaposition is the most visible. Warning, this next section is full of spoilers and is only for people who have completed the game. Towards the end of the game, when you climb up Lucky Quinn's hotel, you spy on a charity auction that reveals that nearly everyone in Chicago from the mayor down is morally corrupt, but they're all racked with guilt and anxiety about it. Just about every named character in this game feels some kind of guilt or has paid some kind of price for what they've done. Except for Lucky Quinn. And that makes him such an asshole. This guy might actually be one of my favorite villains in years. The final confrontation with him was a moment of cathartic, purifying vigilantism that felt about as rightfully earned as the climax of a Max Payne game. Not just because the game spent a whole lot of time painting him as a complete scumbag, but also because 40 hours of frustrating gameplay had boiled up to that point, but that just added to it. It was gratifying payoff, and it was handy handled kind of intelligently, believe it or not. They managed to write in a few smart jabs about what a shallow, pointless, and purely emotional victory it actually was. Lucky Quinn lived a long and comfortable life as a mob boss, and Aiden's years are surely numbered since the whole city on both sides of the law are after him. So you also get some nice food for thought while you make your way through a crazy difficult cop chase that tests everything you learned up to that point. If you don't use the boats, that is. That hotel mission, from beginning to end, is an explosive blaze of glory that explains everything you need to know about the revenge story that begins the game, but does not end the game. Just when you escape from those cops, the game suddenly remembers all those other characters it brought up earlier, and it does a much sloppier rush of a job to wrap up their arcs. Suddenly, you're bopping and crashing through the city, causing a level of chaos that's so ridiculous it rivals Saints Row. Anonymous comes out of nowhere and asks you to help them out even though you have no reason to and had no prior connection with them. And then you hack the whole city itself because the bullshit techno babble comes up with some excuse to shove in more dramatic rhetoric in there about how evil City OS is supposed to be, even though the whole point of the Lucky Quinn mission was that you were able to use it to bring down the most ruthless crime boss in the city. Clara dies pointlessly while doing something completely symbolic to the plot rather than active to the plot and we're supposed to feel bad about it? Even though she betrayed us and wasn't doing anything useful at the time and also said she was going to do something to help even though her dying is the only thing we see her do? Then there's a QTE final boss battle and, and then Jordy, wh why did they make Jordy betray you and die? Wait, I thought Jordy betrayed you and died. This game just keeps going and going. It doesn't even want to stop when it's halfway through the credits. It would have been fine. It, it would have been stronger if they wrote in the ending when the actual climax and the actual final boss happened, but it keeps going for like an hour after that, and it just gets harder to take it seriously the longer that climax goes on. It's like the quality of the game climbed up a really high flight of stairs towards the end, and then someone kicked it right back down. 
Even though it's easy to talk shit about Watch Dogs, I still enjoyed it. But the fact that it's so easy to talk shit about Watch Dogs is a red flag. It's not bad, but it's simply not good enough. There are way, way too many better games out there. I can't confidently recommend it because the parts of the game that are enjoyable can only be enjoyed with qualifiers and compromises. The story has some great moments and a flicker of ingenuity behind it, but most of it is borderline insulting. The gameplay has a fun and smooth stealth system and it's made better in the rooms that give you lots of hacking to do, but the driving's bad and the gunplay's bad and those are both really big parts of the game. There's a couple of creative need 1v1 multiplayer modes in there about picking out human players from crowds of NPCs, but the fairness of that game largely depends on where the invasion happens, and that's assuming that the tech manages to connect the two of you together anyways. And good god, I couldn't stand the licensed soundtrack, but I really enjoyed some of the tracks on the game's original score. It's dark, catchy synth. It was good background music. Anyways, there are things to like in there, but it's not quite enough to make it feel worth $60 and all the tech trouble I had to put up with. It's got some neat ideas, but that actually leaves me more worried. Ubisoft plans to make a franchise out of this game, and its more obvious flaws just give them easy targets for improvement in the inevitable sequels. It is ridiculous that we had to put up with this stuff in the first game, but now they have our expectations low enough so that even bullet impact effects would be a considerable improvement. But for some reason, it still sold really, really well. Which is kind of funny. This game tells a paranoid conspiracy theory story about the society changing potential of marketing and PR. I wonder if they are aware of the irony. So maybe a year or so down the line when they patch it up and lower the price to about $30 or so, Watch Dogs might be worth the trip. But by the time that happens, there may be a Watch Dogs 2 that does the stuff better. And will that really be a good thing? Maybe they'd be doing a better job of getting us hyped for their hot new franchise by making a truly great game out of it first.